Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I am Will. I am Adam. And I'm Norm. Oh, contraction. Oh, one he out always of three. has to do it. He can't. Uh, he can't roll contraction through. Contraction contrarian. He can't. Did he you, can't follow the contraction scheme. The 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 that lovely. So I'm going to take the idea of the contraction and segue right away into the podcasts that I'm cheating on you you're, guys you're with. Che- yeah, I'm I cheating. came in and was like, man, I've really been enjoying <laughs> your your bullshit cheater podcast and you're podcasting with other people, but that's fine. It Unti- has a name. Yeah, it's titled. It's it titled. titled. It's yeah. not untitled and it's that's no longer right. still untitled. No, the other podcast is... Uh, sci- origin Stories. Origin, Sci-Fi 25 Origin Stories. So um, you had Neil Gaiman, Chris Hardwick. I've listened to a bunch of them so far. Nettie Okorafor, uh, DC Fontana, Ron oh, Moore. DC Fontana. I mean, every every one of these interviews was so yeah, it was awesome. Like, I, I don't want to gush too much. I did a lot of press about it. Mm-hmm. I'm really proud of how the how the interviews went. Um, I would keep doing this show for a long time. Like, if Sci-Fi wanted, hey, Sci-Fi, if you want to keep going, we, don't, we can don't let's put, totally on, make that deal. Don't put all your cards out on the table here. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> kind of side eye him a little I'm, bit, kind of no, just no, no. be like. Eh. I'm just to say, it was straight up, straight up fun. My team was. Amazing was really great. Much better than the chuckleheads over here. I know. <laughs> well, the way I've been pitching it is that you know people have watched uh, what we've done for a while. We've obviously podcast. It's a different flavor of podcast because totally. it's not a conversation. It's a big boy podcast. It, it is an interview series, much like we used to do with the talking room. Yeah, yeah. Um, except not having to worry about video, and some of them you could do remotely. I did. I did probably about half of them remotely, which wasn't as awesome as doing them direct. Yeah, I, I find. Like having done a lot of podcasts in the last year and year and a half, guest spots and stuff, I really like going into a room where you can look people in the eye. There's something there's something you can't makes it, a huge it, difference. It makes a huge difference. Is that like like Zencaster and some there's they're good solutions that work around the remote thing, but it's still not quite the same. Right? I mean, look, I wouldn't mind a Skype picture of the person. Uh, it there is a way in which I notice that my affect is tamped down on a phone call that when it isn't in in the room. <laughs> yeah. um, one of my favorite notes I kept on getting from my producer Jennifer on the Sci-Fi uh, Origin Stories podcast was she kept on holding up signs going less technical detail. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not because sci-fi is afraid of technical detail, not by any stretch of the imagination, but there was a couple, like when I was interviewing John Knoll, we went way down a rabbit hole. Inventor of knolling. Inventor of, no, no, mm-hmm. actually. I know, I know, writer I know. Writer of Photoshop. I yes, writer of Photoshop. Uh, actually, the, the guy who designed the original 3D Death Star in Star Wars, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Did the uh, Star Trek Next Generation warp effect. Yep, yep. yeah. Um, yeah. John is a, uh, is a legend, and we, John and I were actually at a party last weekend together. Not together, but we were at the same party, and someone walked up to the pair of us and said, so uh, what do you guys do? There was oh this God. long pause, and I said, I wrote Photoshop, <laughs> and John went, and I used to host Mythbusters. That's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. So awesome. Awful. That's so, terrible. It's interesting because for some of this uh, 15 interviews that you did, yeah. many of them were people that you were either acquainted with or friends with that you had good rapport with. Mm-hmm. But some of them were the first time you've met them. Yeah. And you were learning. I mean, the whole thing was to discuss uh, love of science fiction mm-hmm. and their own personal origin stories. Yeah. Did you learn any interesting things? Completely. No, no, no. So... I said this in a lot of the press, but sci-fi didn't. The, sci-fi came to the first meeting with me about this podcast without a list of people they were hoping I'd interview. Well, they want. I mean, I hope. I would hope with your network of people, they would come in and say, "Pick your twenty-five favorite well, science fiction and, and people." It, right? It, it wasn't even like that. They were just like, "We don't have. We don't want to impose any." outside thing on this we want to work it out with you and so i you know i called up to people that i knew people like jonathan frakes and uh neil gaiman and you know the guys at ilm doug chang john uh john Noel, rick baker uh, yeah, no. um and then they brought in people like dc fontana Nettie akorafor son <sighs> aminat and like these interviews were so uh so invigorating and because those folks weren't on my first list radar, for me it was like this awesome treat of getting to unpack this, uh, these other ways of looking at the same thing that I love. Right? I, I sit down with, with with Doug Chang, and it's not like I know exactly where it's going to go, but I, I, I understand the territory. You know, I know yeah. Doug, and we've, we have a working we've had relationship. this chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for me, 
it was just there. There's equal parts of awesome in some of the interviews of people that I knew as much as the people but, I didn't but, know. But like somebody like DC Fontana comes in and like she she she, she right? She's mm-hmm. yeah. I mm-hmm. never I never I was yeah. I, I was like she's one of the early women writing she's Star Trek. Yeah, totally. And and so she was there when science fiction was still a super super small like edge case niche, mm-hmm. and then watched it become this massive mainstream thing where the science fiction movies are making billions of dollars every year. My favorite bit of comeuppance that I got was in my interview with DC as I said, so you worked on the original Star Trek in the 60s and then of course you worked on the reboot about the next generation and she went, she basically went, stop right there. Yeah. There was an animated Star Trek series. I was like, yeah, no, I know about that. She's like, right. None of the writers or any of the production staff of Star Trek consider that anything less than a full-blown reboot of Star Trek. Mm. It was the same writer's huh. room, the same complexity of plots, and same char- same complexity of character development just happened to be animated. So she was really clear that within the canon of Star Trek, the animated series belongs after the TOS. And that was really cool to well, me. I didn't expect have that. Have you watched those? Like, those hold I up haven't. really well. No, I haven't. No, but she, like, those are yeah. sto- genuine storylines that they consider they're, canon. Uh-huh. They're all streaming on, I think, Netflix or Hulu or something like now and I sat down when I I went through and rewatched the whole TOS a few years ago yeah it was like super interesting to go back and see that through the lens of 50 years in the past yeah and then the animated series literally picks up like it's the five-year mission it's the it's the holes filled in the five-year mission right right and it's it's really well done like it's really well done the animation's a little janky by modern standards but, but I, I loved the that creator I'm being so proud of the creation and like and so, like as soon as she said that I'm never gonna let that one slide well, like and, that mm-hmm. It totally belongs within that And that's canon. a perspective that you're going to get from the writer in the writer's Ooh. room. And the fact that this was a selection of people who were writers, actors, creators, directors, yep. uh, fans, but many different perspectives across. It's multidimensional, right? Yeah. D- different. Their relationships different across different timelines. And but, I, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, and, and it just it, you can talk about the same topic from so many different directions, so many different ways. Absolutely. And there, of course, in a lot of the early tweets this weekend when this went live, people were like, how, how did you not interview so-and-so? How did you how did you miss so-and-so? And the answer is, like, when you make a list of 15 people to try and cover the scope of science fiction, you're going to lose. There's nothing you can possibly do. I could host this podcast for 20 years and not, there's not an, hit everybody. There's an infinity of people. <laughs> there really is. Yeah. And it would be, I think it would, it would miss the point to just, just get the 15 people that immediately come to mind right. that, for, for sci-fi fans. Well, and obviously we're interviewing people, many of whom are actively working constantly. And so the scheduling, because there were lots of people on our list who said yes, yes, they wanted to do it, but we couldn't find the time. We couldn't coordinate with Jordan Vote Roberts, who directed Kong. Mm-hmm. I really wanted him, and we had a great uh, conversation at the Comic-Con. Skull, Skull Island Kong. Skull Island yeah. Kong, yeah. Um, Which was and, and really was, well, good. And like there it's was a, a bunch of them. Yeah. yeah, there was well, a bunch of interviews we weren't able to so, do. So when I do, when I prep like an episode of the Foo Show and I need to talk to a game developer th- whose work I'm you know, familiar with, but I want to know more about that. And kind of like my goal, one of my goals is always, and this is one of our goals on the talking room too, is to kind of find the questions that people haven't asked them a million times. Mm-hmm. And kind of, you know, everybody knows, like when you talk to, to um, uh, uh, Jason Reitman, then you know, we talked we talked about all sorts of stuff that I'd never heard in an interview before. Right. Um, what like what's your like I go through and listen to podcasts that they do with other people because it's always like you, if you do a 40 minute podcast with somebody you're going to get past the first five minutes of interview questions I'm kind of curious what your prep process is um, for a show like that it's multifold um, on one level yes I usually listen to like three mainstream interviews with that person to hear the five questions they always get mm-hmm. and those Look, I want I want to service the vans and I want to make sure we cover territory that's necessary in order to get to the deeper stuff. And if it's a question they constantly get and they got a great story, I'll ask that question uh, or I'll ask it in a slightly different way to try and get a different answer. But, you know, I, I don't mind getting the same question as a person being interviewed. So uh, yeah, that's the beginning. OK. Um, Sci-Fi had its own set of questions that it wanted. Um, but I also brought in a ringer to help me uh, compile questions. And his name is Norman Chan. Turns out Norman Chan knows oh. a lot about science fiction. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, Norman, you, Norm, you had done so much uh, on the talking room, so you will, mm-hmm. about helping me gain perspective past my own myopia of interviewing this person. Mm-hmm. And that just turned out to be the really secret sauce between, like, I could tell you, even though I never saw the breakdown, 
there were times when you were just working with sci-fi and I'd get a full mm-hmm. list of questions, but I could tell you which ones were norms. You can always tell which ones are norms. Yeah. And and even just the difference of the flavor of those gives me new directions to think about. The, the, in reality, when I sit down to an interview, I've read over the questions enough that I pretty much don't look at the sheet throughout the whole interview. Right. But it gives me... It gives me landscapes and places to go. Well, it's, it's it's both a comfort in that if you have a lull and you don't know where to go next, you have a new jumping off point. But, but like, Oh, my God, the lull. I spend, I spend all the time interviewing just absolutely fucking terrified. I'm going to run out. I'm going to yeah. have nothing to fill but, the next space. But it, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. No, I know. But I never, nonetheless, it is like it is my I have a test and I don't I'm not wearing pants moment. Well, but and sometimes sometimes having the giving the room that moment like gives the person you're talking to, uh, you know, it's uncomfortable for people on both sides, right? Yeah. So, so you get, you have that. It gives them an opportunity to kind of jump in if they've had something they've wanted to hit that you haven't given them an opportunity to get to. And sometimes that's the best stuff, right? Like this is true. This is totally true. Um, and it's different if they're on the phone and I'm sitting there and I'm like doodling, which is kind of one of the ways <laughs> I listen. I'll sit there and doodle and I'll like mark off which questions I've asked to kind of give myself a sense of the landscape. Um, And I can see questions coming because I can look down. But if I'm in person with someone, I don't want to take that pause and go, that's great. Hey, so what about that thing that time? So I'm very sensitive to the the, The the actual conversational dynamic of two people in a room together. And I like, you know, it's... And it's okay it's to go through. It's something that will change over time. It's just yeah. I, interviewing is both hard and super fun all at the same well, you, time. It's a muscle. It's like yeah. anything else. Yeah. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And like I, it's one of the things that I fear having taken essentially two. Like I used to interview people every day. Mm-hmm. Now I do it once a month, maybe if I'm really, really working hard. Right. And like it's it's hard to. It's one of the reasons I started doing the game streams is so to I get have back a, in. like mm-hmm. just keep that going. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, that sounds so that sounds great. A, it's September 11th. It is. Well, 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 moment of silence. <laughs> Go ahead. Should we talk about how it's the best September 11th ever, or how? Uh, well, so it is, I'm, 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 it also I'm making to... a joke about our president, our commander in chief, oh, talking through the moment of silence this morning. <laughs> right. oh, really? Yeah. What a great that. crowd! What a great turnout! Oh yeah, Let's terrific. have a moment of silence. This is the best moment of silence I've ever about had. How big this crowd is! What a what a fantastic group um, of people no, we uh, have here. It's actually also my anniversary today. Oh, I didn't know that. I got married. I got married. Well, so to the. I met my wife, Mrs. Don't Try This. Her name is Julia. She's a wonderful and amazing human. She's um, a delightful human being. I met her online, actually. We met through online dating service. Hold on. Match.com? No. Oh, actually, no, Nerve. Nerve. I was, on Nerve. Yes. I was on Nerve. She was on... Does uh, that exist anymore? Uh, it might. And that's the equivalent. Of my, the place that my wife and I went on wow. our first date no longer exists. So well, I was on Nerve. She was on Salon.com, but they both shared the same oh, yeah. backbone. Oh, yeah. The date, the <laughs> API or whatever it was. Um, that's and then uh, we were we met uh, in November of 2003, and we were married in September of 2004. Oh, wow. We were quick about it. So did you, it was just just the Saturday that worked for your schedule. I mean, no, I assume you were so, shooting MythBusters no, we, at that so point, right? So we decided. Right? We decided. We yes, I was shooting MythBusters. Um, we decided we wanted to get married at the Marin Headlands Art Center in okay. Marin uh, in the Marin Headlands, and it's a magnificent it's lovely, space. Yeah. And we said, um, "This is like April of 2004," and we're like, "We'd love to get married sometime in the next ten months." And they were like. <laughs> Really? And we're like, oh, yeah. And they're like, there is nothing. And I'm like, nothing. And I'm like, well, we've got some Sundays. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not going to make our people travel on a Sunday. We want a Saturday. Saturday. We want a yeah. classic wedding day. And they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, there's nothing. And I went, I have this special thing where when someone says no too fast, I ask again. Yeah. So there's no date between now and next day. <laughs> Well, there is December 27th. Okay. I feel you. Mm. Let's write yeah. that one off. Yeah. You no. Know. But there's no Saturday between now and a year from now. Well, there is one. Oh, which one might it be? Well, it's September 11th. And we thought, let's take this. Yes, we want to get married on this day. But let's also take this day back and have it mean something good as well as something so, so, so awful. Um, So, yeah, we were married on September 11th. That's hmm. 13 years. Congratulations. 400 million seconds. That's how long we've been married. Nice. And it does not feel that long at all. 11 million seconds, right? 11, yeah, give or take. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of 11 days. Yeah, 27 and a half years is a billion seconds. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to see my... I mean, my second billion, I got 10 years on still, 12 years on I, still. I like, so. I like counting the days in seconds, because if you count them in days, like how long your life is in days, it's not well, that so, many. You know, we've only been together for 156 months. Right. So right, exactly. like, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this, yeah. Oh, this second <laughs> thing, though, is one of my favorite science fiction tropes. Like, when you think about an interstellar civilization... Days are meaningless, right? Because days right. are based around the orbit of mm-hmm. one particular oh, yeah. the yep. rotation, one particular yes. planet around one particular sun. Yeah. So really, <laughs> the way to think about days is in terms of kiloseconds, right? So like, if you look at like the Ian Banks culture novels, which are my all time favorite science fiction novels, mm-hmm. or I think this Charlie Strauss post singularity stuff does this too. It's all kiloseconds, which and requires that's a thousand s- seconds per hour. A thousand? No, because uh, uh, an hour is thirty six hundred seconds, right? right. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at it, it, like uh, it's megaseconds, I guess. I, it's, no, it's a tenth of a mega. It's a hundred thousand. So seconds it's 100 a hundred kiloseconds is basically a day. Oh. One hundred twenty five kiloseconds is basically uh, so the, a day. The base unit is still derived from our orbit around the sun. Well, but well, but I think that there's actually an SI measurement for a second that has to do with the number of vibrations of a cesium atom or something like that, uh, right? And, it, and it's so, similar enough. So yeah, it's it's an actual like it. They found the the probably they probably found the thing that vibrated the right speed to make it the second, right? But yeah, and and chose that arbitrarily as but yeah. it's universal constant. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So anyway, wow. kill a second. Here's some All more. Right. Yeah. All right. You, you should get Charlie Strauss. If you get to do this again, you need to get Charlie Strauss because he's he is a fascinating I interview. I totally will. I totally will. And uh, we're gonna go out to dinner to a nice dinner tonight. Cool. Right. And um, it's been a it's been a reasonably busy yet quiet day. I don't know how to explain it better than that. It's, yeah. I mean, I think I think that the best case for you on quiet days is that it's busy yet <laughs> I punctuated got some by shit periods today. of quiet. It's so yeah. funny because the past two podcasts we've talked about projects that we have not filmed. Right. And we'll do some filming here and there around. And I think we're going to talk about another one today that you have on the table. Oh, yes. Yes, the, uh, the, the, the DL-44 blaster. You, you guys did one of these a few years ago. Uh, we yeah. built norms, yeah, which is often mistaken for mine. I know. Like, people are like, I loved your DL-44 build. I'm like, technically, that was norms. And they're like, I didn't hear anything you just said. Norm, <laughs> norm spent a long time doesn't, collecting the parts to do that, as I recall. Me. Um, so this is my build. And yeah. Norm turned me on to a company selling an all-aluminum airsoft version of a DL-44, of a, of a broom handle Mauser. Mm-hmm. Um, Dave Oldberg sent me the tip, a friend who was the VFX supervisor on Con Air. Oh, ah, random, random. I trivia. did not realize that one of the uh, greatest of the Nick Cage movies. I love that movie. It's great, like that. The Rock and what was the third movie <laughs> made we, that time? We bashed and talked about how we look much to love that movie on this podcast. Uh, yeah, we've gone sure we <laughs> Anyway, uh, this <laughs> aluminum. Who makes this Mauser? Uh, it's an aerosol. I'm going to post it in the comments below. All right. Yeah. Um, the the broom handle itself, the the aluminum one you can order comes with a plastic handle, um, mm-hmm. and it's not the classic uh, tight. Uh, what do you call this? Not checkering, but the grip it's like neural. Lines. It's not neuraled. Neural yeah. is when it's the back and These forth, grip yeah. lines are super close together on the hero weapon that he's carrying through most of Star Wars. Star Wars? Is this New Hope? Uh, this is New Hope. Yeah. Um, so these came from a replica props forum run. Oh. Okay. Um, so got, and they're, they're milled. They're milled. I sanded nice. them, stained them, and then lacquered them. Um, but uh, the the aluminum Mauser came with the front shroud that is pre-blacked and a scope, which while it does not have the letters etched on it, right. we've been working up that technology yep. here. So we can we'll get be happy done. to do yours. Ooh. You've ordered one of these too, am I, I have, correct? Yes. Um, I think this is a darn good looking. Uh, That's a lovely design. norm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as your as your. Sorry for po- putting know, it down on the table, your, pointed at your, your belly. Your gun, your gun safety there. Years on MythBusters is totally it's, worn off. It's I can really see. Really funny because you posted something on Twitter. You um, now yeah. have three. The Harrison Ford Harrison, trifecta. Yes. People were like, what about the whip? So I, I actually took a picture of the whip. I'm going to post that too. What would yeah. be a trifecta if you had the whip? That's four things. I don't think there's, there's a, a, is there a word. No. Yeah, you can you can bet on which four things are coming in in the right. Uh, look, if there's a way, yeah, if there's a way to bet money on it. Quad, then, quaternary yeah, you can, somebody's invented it. Mm. <laughs> All right, um, but if you put the guns side by side. It's by far the most ridiculous looking. <laughs> it is totally Andy Richter immediately. That middle one looks really stupid. Yeah, oh, it's the coolest. <laughs> I mean, look, the Blade Runner gun is amazing and it's lovely, and yours is, is uh, exceptional. 
But you this know, is the this is the one that I grew up with my finger pointing and shooting at people in my backyard. And being able to take this, uh, you know, this knob and weather it down so yeah. you can see the the brass and to take some steel wool to the front of this and really fine tune it is a deep pleasure. What, what changes the Empire one? It's a silver. It's, it's a silver like right? it's There's like gun? six different blasters oh, that yeah. he carries throughout the movies. There yeah. is so many variants mm -hmm. that. It's 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 nearly arbitrary. I haven't even been able to wrap my head around all the particulars Deleted of all scenes, the variants. The laser desk. The you Greedo assume. killer is different yeah. than this yes. one. You assume that like when he leaves the Millennium Falcon each morning, he just has a rack of DL forty fours and he picks the one that he wants, <laughs> yes. right? It's like this one goes with my outfit today. So and of course, when, the, when the new movie comes out, it's got, it's got to be in the film, right? I mean, I guess he well, had, he, new, he, the, he well, had one. Force Awakens. Awakens. Well, well, Awakens one. The Force Awakens one is a MGC base yes. DL forty four, and which is also different than the one they used in like the poster, yeah. the one, uh, <laughs> which is I think a straight up Denix. Yeah, it, it looks very much like one. Wow. Does, does, does anyone want to hear us keep talking about you this? Guys I think are we should yes. nerds. The answer is yes. Uh, but with the upcoming film, you know, they they had to make one for the film and de you know, have it be as issued probably, or in the uh, in the books, you know, the idea is that he cobbled it and he modified it to have the fastest. Um, yeah, the fastest release. Like hair trigger. Oh, really? Yeah, hair trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I didn't just, know that. Just so like uh, the Millennium Falcon be... was cobbled together out of a what YT twenty three thousand or something. Brilliant. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, oh, the I don't know if this is spoiler territory, but the idea is that we hopefully will see in the the new film the Millennium Falcon actually hauling. Hauling. Ooh, hauling. Oh, actually being a like space being tug. a space freighter. The, yeah, freighter. Yeah. Freighter. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Have you guys talked about um have you have you guys talked about uh the thing that I can't remember what I was gonna ask now? Um, the Millennium hey, Falcon Lego set. The Millennium Falcon Lego set, thank I, you, Norm. I mind read him. You knew yeah, you wow. force, I, I force, saw, force he, read. Mind meld brotherly <laughs> uh, love stuff. We going have on not there. uh oh my God. we're aware of it. I yeah. people have tweeted at us that there is this Millennium Falcon Lego set. It's really expensive and it's, really big. It's eight hundred dollars. It's, it's seven and a half thousand pieces. Yeah, yeah. fifteen hundred more pieces than the previous it's one. Like ten cents a piece. It's both. Now, now that's that's the that's the, the metric. The metric. Is that yeah. the standard metric? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just did it, it, like, math when my people head. Is, is Lego is this Lego set overpriced? Well, is it ten cents a piece? Yeah, it is. Oh, okay, I guess it's fair. <laughs> but usually the Star Wars ones are a little bit more because of the license, I think. But but the reviewers will say you know ten cents a piece, but. 200 of these pieces are like or tracks of a tread or right. tiny tiles. Yeah. Like, then yeah. you're not getting really the good money. The sand crawler, not a great value. Yeah. Uh, we are definitely aware of it. We are hoping to build it at some point in the future. Oh. Um, yeah. And that's uh, all we're going to say right now. And we, okay. and we may have a line on the original one. So, so. Well, you ha we built the original I know. one. That's a, we do have a line on the original one. Yeah, I mean, one. there's no surprise on that. <laughs> what? Um, what uh, tell me, Will, what you have been up to. Uh, so uh, I can finally talk about all the stuff that I haven't been able to talk about for the last, like, six months. Oh, awesome. Um, we uh, at Foo have got a couple things that just came out in the last few weeks. So one is that we did a, a series of ads with GameStop mm -hmm. using our animated characters. We put them in games using green screen technology and all sorts of interesting super imposition. I saw them on TV. Would you saw, I haven't seen them on wow, TV on yet. Television. I saw it on television. Woo! I know. And I knew oh, that, I said, Will made that ad. Yeah. You can How? tell from the animation, right? It's uh, very foo esque. <laughs> how how was it working on an actual commercial production? So I'd never worked on an actual commercial before, and that was one of the hardest days I've ever like like. You know, when we work on tested, it's a small crew, yeah. and it's like three or four people, and like it's, shit goes wrong, and it's just kind of the way things go when you work with a small crew, and everybody's everybody's pretty chill about it, yeah. and, and you like roll, roll on. Yeah, on this commercial shoot, there are like twenty five people there. And it's still a very tiny crew for it's a commercial. A, it is a very small crew. Yeah. But like I, the last thing you want to be is the guy that's holding everybody else up and making their day longer and adding to costs because there's some union people. Yeah. Some people are union, some people aren't. Yeah. And like there's all sorts of complexity with that stuff. And so it was like and it, my stuff was the stuff that was most likely to break. Yeah. You know, because we're doing some weird experimental yeah, yeah, VR yeah. animation. And and it worked. It worked. F like, everything worked really well. Um, we've done two more shoots since then. We've shot a four or five spots. And Amazing. Like, the, the, the complexity of what we're doing with each shoot gets higher and higher. The actors who are playing the guys in the commercials are getting more and more comfortable. Like, they're finding the roles. And, like, it's, it's becoming... Like, like we're beginning to kind of appreciate the absurdist nature of putting these, you know, cartoon, essentially cartoon guys into these weird. Anyway, it's it's been really it's been a great learning experience. It's been really fun. God, that's awesome. Um, that sounds like so much fun. And then last week I was in Atlanta. That's why I wasn't here last week. But we were shooting the second episode and we shot a pilot last last winter with Adult Swim of 
of uh, a sports show that they're doing that's right. live, a live call-in sports show Holy with uh, two cartoon hosts. Ah. And uh, it features Carl New, Carl from New Jersey mm-hmm. um, from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. And uh, it's called uh, uh, Pre-Game Prognostifications from the Pigskin Wizard. That's right. Football um, season. Football season started last week. Right. Uh, it was it was on, and uh, people can like call or Skype in to talk to Carl. He has this whole big virtual set. He drinks beer. He eats he eats chicken wings, um, and uh, the the so the guys who made the the original Aqua Teen are the are voicing Carl and and some of the other characters. It was really like it was. A I've loved Adult Swim for a really really long time. Yeah, like yeah. like starting with Space Ghost way back when I was probably in college still. Like what they do with animation is kind of uh, it, it's it's kind of like what Mike Judge did with Beavis and Butthead and and the 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 uh, liquid television people were doing on MTV in the in the nineties. It, like it's really fascinating. It was amazing to go in there and watch those those folks work and and get to be the tiniest little. I mean, I guess we we do animate all do all the animations. Yeah. So we're not the tiniest little. You're part, getting a really awesome ringside seat um, to to play with these guys. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome, fabulous, and, and like. Yeah, the 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 Dave Willis who plays Carl is like you. He basically comes in with a list of topics he's going to hit, and then just does like six minutes off the cuff on the on the topics and mm. goes through the segments. Mm. And play, I mean, Carl's a horrible, horrible person. Just to be clear, <laughs> he's not. He's, Dave is a lovely human being. Carl is an absolute dirtbag. Were you in Atlanta for Dragon Con? I was not. Wow, I should. I was last it, weekend. Yeah, I got in on Monday Monday night. Oh, we had right, Labor Day when they weekend were sweeping stuff. off. The yeah, all, like all the hotels. I, I thought you would have seen Mayor McCheese there. All the lift, <laughs> all the lift drivers were really, really like, "You're not with Dra- Dragon Con, are you?" You look so, like a Dragon Con. You look like you might be a Dragon Con person. They don't like it. <laughs> uh, apparently, there were some like drunken kerfluffles out uh, in the street in the wee hours of the morning. This their year. costumes ripped my leather. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> some guy got in and wanted. He was dressed up like a like a Ewok, and I, I, it seemed like he might not have pants on. I don't <laughs> know. No one got fucking what. Yeah. So so yeah, Atlanta was great. It was nice to go to a place where the weather's nice for a change. It is <laughs> Are you kidding? It's it, it, yes. Atlanta was awesome. Really? Yeah, the weather was awesome. Oh my in Atlanta. god, compared to it here. It's been terrible it's here. It's still been sixty percent humidity here. Yeah, I'm like sweating like, all day like long. Everything sticks to you. Oh, it's Why awful. would people live here? This is this all like I've gotten so good at manipulating the fans in my house uh-huh. in the last three weeks. It's like, okay, it's below seventy eight degrees. Time to turn on the exhaust fans. Well, that was so we we're we're, we're, we're not, thing thing two is off and living in Los Angeles, but thing one is living in the house. And what we have now is a war of a war of of who's using Who's using the Dyson fan? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. bought a refurb Dyson fan. Uh, oh, my God. On Amazon a few, a few years the ago. The invisible blower? Yeah. yeah. I, I have one of those. I lost the remote. Uh-oh. I can't increase the power. I didn't know there was a remote. Mine is all dials. Mine does not have a dial. It has a what? power button. Does and it not have an app? It goes to power five, and that's it. Well, that sounds okay. At least no, it's power that's not five okay. max that's speed. That's really no, loud. It's ten. You, Oh, is you're running half power? <laughs> yes. Scotty, she she can't take much more of this. Talk about no, bad design. There must be a solution to this yeah, you're problem. Probably I, eBay have, I, have, I have Googled in the heat as my phone is overheated <laughs> yes. in front of the fan. So, why won't you turn and why won't you go to okay, high power? I'm going to tell you a secret. I you're probably, fancy. I could, in, but in the moment, when I dig it out of the closet because it's 106 degrees in, in San Francisco yeah. for the first time in 100 years. We were the hottest place on earth that day. Yeah. Were we really? But like we were right up there with Abu Dhabi and like places that like I've been yeah. to Abu Dhabi and that place is no joke. The heat is like <laughs> look, opening an oven and walking around look, in it. At one point, <laughs> at one point when I looked up in the the nest was like it's ninety seven degrees in your office. <laughs> I was like, I don't care how hot it is. I'm turning on the fan just so I feel anything. And I turned on the fan and I immediately turned it off and shut the window because it was it was literally like standing behind a bus. <laughs> right? I was just like, this is this worst. is the worst feeling. Oh, oh I'm gonna yeah. go open the oven up and put my head in there because it's cooler. Yeah. This, I got more heat bits if you want them. It's 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 it's, it's bad. <laughs> um, we 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 I mean we can't complain like, we so, shouldn't be complaining about weather because the weather no, in other places right. has been a different kind That's of right. deadly and so awful. Separate, right, I know. Yeah. And uh, Florida is drowning and the West is on fire, Canada and the US. Yeah. Um we had an interaction this weekend. So and, Julie, and Houston's still boned too, just right, for the no, record. Right. Yeah. No, let's all God, it's terrible. Um we have a uh, happy uh, anniversary, Adam. Thank you. 
we we have uh, uh, bedside tables like most people. Yeah. And on a bedside table every night, we put a glass of ice water. Yep. It's a standard part of yes. our uh, MO. Here. And I've got a little coaster. Yep. And these coasters were handmade. And they're like silk embroidery or something like that that someone gave us for our wedding or something years ago. Yeah. And my wife is putting my water down this weekend and she goes, oh, look at this this coaster makes me realize and know that I'm married to a hardworking man. And she holds up the coaster, and it's dirty. It's actually got, like, dirt. And it's visibly, like, grease dirt. So the water right? is com- comes off of the glass? So, so, so I go, yeah, I noticed that. Isn't that funny? And she, and she then goes off, my wife, on a, like, a ten-minute tirade of, I am, she says, when I think about holding a glass of of water that has moisturized to the outside of the glass, like the bottom of that glass is really pretty much maybe the cleanest thing in this room. Like it's not going anywhere. It goes from the dishwasher to get filled and then I put it on. So how is the coaster dirty? How, (laughs) in what possible permutation did you get dirt from you onto a thing that no one ever needs to touch that only is ever touched by the cleanest cleanest, thing in this room? Wet new water. (laughs) And we concluded that in some in some heat fevered haze, I must have taken the damp coaster and swabbed my <laughs> brow with it. Oh, gross. That's amazing. Gross. I mean, in fairness, you're 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 dirty. I'm a dirty bird. You're a it's dirty totally boy. True. Ceramic coasters <laughs> wicking away the heat. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that's what it is. Look, my dogs lick eating ice cubes out of my ice water at night. <laughs> We've had so much. Like it's so humid. It's unusual here, but it's so humid that like the. Like, the, if you put a glass of ice water out, it's just That's whatever's it. underneath it is soaked in, like, four minutes now. I yeah. came into the shop on the day after the first heat wave, and some of the, um, we have a bunch of cardboard photos we've used for parties in the past, and I've hanged yeah. some of them on the wall. One of them bowed to such a right. large degree, it fell off the wall and knocked my, like, sorting oh. bin of dowels off the wall. I came in to find dowels, like, everywhere. Well, that's like a Dirk Gently mystery there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so I got out my steampunk crossbow and I went investigating. Nice. Very good. Turk nice. Right. Very good. Yeah. Yes. yes. I thought yes, you'd yes. appreciate that. Yes. I, I read the books. I haven't watched the TV show But, yet. but seriously, uh, some parts of the U.S. and also like U.S. Virgin Islands under serious trouble and but, totally I mean, worth making some donations. Barbuda, Absolutely. Um, you, you the know Red Cross makes it very easy to make donations from your phone. Text, uh, I don't know the exact thing, but we'll put it at the end of there's this post. Also, um, there's also a bunch of resources that, that uh, rep- represent local charities yeah. uh, specifically designed for hurricane shelters and stuff like that. Uh, you posted a good link the other night from a basketball player, I think. Tim Duncan from the U.S. Virgin Islands. He's matching up to a million dollars. I went to my Amazon order page and I looked at, on that page, the things that I bought that I did not need and took that mount, and I said, "Okay, that's what I'm going to donate." Nice. Because, like, I didn't need. Why did I need those things? I right, did right, it. Right, right. If I can afford those things, I can afford to donate. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so he specifically that post. You, you should post that link in the, in yeah. the show notes because it was a great post. He explained how he was there. I think on Hurricane Hugo when he was a 13 year old, and and like the, how the first few weeks are the most important, especially on those islands where there aren't like a where, where, it's, where it's difficult yeah. to get things where there's no resources where they expect power to be out for six months in some cases and we're talking about places in which like a 90 percent of the buildings on some of these islands have been decimated yeah yeah so so yeah um take a look and and um i mean also this is a great time to look at your 72 hour kit and refill it and replace yeah. all the stuff that you're making sure i i actually just double checked all the water the water jugs i keep in the house uh Whoop. One of the things we added last year to ours is a water filtration kit because, huh. like, you can keep enough water, but if you can clean the water that you can collect or, or get from creeks or whatever, then that helps a ton. I use a gravity system Ooh. that for my camping. I did a lot of research a couple of years ago and found that the gravity feed camping filters actually filter more water faster than almost any other specific type. Are these like the big canvas sacks that you just run down to the lake or creek or whatever and fill up and then hang from a tree and it gives you a spigot I, at the bottom? I suppose that might be one of the form yeah. factors. The one I got, I can't remember the name of it, but it's it's about a liter. Um, and it'll do a liter in a couple of minutes, like oh, three yeah. or four minutes. Um, and so it's a double bag system. So you fill one and then it fill, feeds into the other. And there's this way in which you handle it to make sure you don't cross contaminate. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's really good. Uh, so I've got that in my camping go bag as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, and Burning mm-hmm. Man was this weekend. And uh, I, none of us went to Burning Man, but I got to tell you, the traffic in San Francisco was absolutely Great. dreamy. I mean, 
<laughs> Burning Man weekend is traditionally one of my favorite weekends of the year in San Francisco because it's, it's you can you can go to brunch anywhere you want. You don't have to wait in line. You can wash your just wash your car beforehand. Absolutely. Yeah. Get your, do your car wash before they get back. <laughs> oh yeah, right. All the car oh, yeah. washes are just nothing but yeah, decimated black rock dust. Um, yeah. A bunch of stuff going on this week. Uh, I think we have a build going up this week. Adam uh, did a infrastructure build in the cave in a place you've never seen before. Oh, oh yeah, right, this, right, is, right. this is nice work. That was really, a major improvement. Yeah, Ju- see, uh, uh, my wife was here just the other day for the first time since I'd done that repair. She was like, whoa! Yeah, so look forward deeply satisfied to that. that. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, we put an announcement last week, but the uh, members of the Tested Premium community, uh, this year we announce our annual gift, and it is going to be the uh, seven-inch record that Adam recorded at Third Man Records. What? Um, so, yes, if you're a member, oh. you're, you'll get it this year. Oh, I'm a member. Yeah. Uh, and then also um, in uh, San Francisco this Thursday, you're doing an interview. I don't know if tickets are available, but... Uh, J.J. J.J., I'm sorry. I, there's like so much going on. Yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I am interviewing J.J. on stage at City Arts and Lectures um, alongside Andy Cruz from House Industries. Uh, the House Industries, the wonderful font shop and design house, has just released a book called um, Enthusiasm. The process is the enthusiasm. Is the, Sorry, the process is the inspiration. Um, which, of course, speaks deeply to yeah. everything that I believe in my whole life. So the three of us are going to have a, a long-form conversation on stage at the Norse Auditorium I here in San so. Francisco on oh, Thursday cool. night. I'm um, really looking forward It'll to it. will be on the radio also afterward for, yes. uh, for the people in the Bay Area. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's it. Uh, whew, let's get out of here. Yeah, there, there was a lot. Um, lovely day, gentlemen. Yeah. Stay cool. Happy anniversary. Thank you very much. Hey, if you want to see the Carl thing, it's on adultswim.com at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. We will have a link. Is there yeah. a link? Can yeah, we link to it? I'll give you a link. Then we'll All make right. a link. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. Ah! Let's, Let's try again. again. Yeah, it's a do-over. <clears throat>